the crucifixion of Jesus Christ is a scene in the history of the world in which we see so much evil and sin and suffering and pain. It is disturbing and even shocking to witness the violence that the people use against Jesus. But some say that a violence is a necessary part of life on earth, that we need it, and even that God uses violence to destroy the powers of sin and death. Some say that violence was necessary for Jesus to do what he did on the cross. Without the violence, there would not even have been a cross to begin with, and thus there would be no salvation without it. Their point, if you don't believe it, just look at all of it that God allows to happen to God's only Son, Jesus Christ. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is praying to the Father when the peace and quiet is broken by Judas, showing up and bringing with him a group of soldiers and police. They break the peace with their armor and weapons. They disturb the darkness with their lanterns and torches that cast shadows over Jesus and his apostles. The peace of the evening is quickly ended as they arrive to arrest who we know to be an innocent man. And the reaction to this by Simon Peter is what you would expect. The injustice is evident. Simon Peter raises his sword to save Jesus. In the best excuse for just war ever, in the best excuse to justify violence, to save Jesus himself, he swift, swiftly brings the sword down and strikes off the right ear of one of those arresting Jesus. Simon Peter is determined to return violence for violence. But to his and our surprise, Jesus stops him. Jesus calmly tells Simon Peter to put his sword back in its sheath. We see quite clearly here that Jesus is not willing to play the game that we would expect him to play or even hope for him to play. Jesus is not willing to return violence for violence. And we see that he is not even willing to allow others to do it for him. Instead, he is going to just take whatever they give him. I imagine the shock on Simon Peter's face when he learns that violence is not even okayed by Jesus to save God's only son. In frustration, Simon Peter watches the soldier, the officer, and the Jewish police arrest Jesus and bind him and take him from him. Now we know they take Jesus to the high priest to be questioned. And during this interaction, the violence against Jesus only increases. Jesus is unfairly questioned. They have made their judgment against him before he ever arrived. And so it is no surprise that when Jesus starts to answer honestly, they become offended. And one of the police standing near Jesus lifts his hand and strikes him on the face. Putting Jesus in his place, he says, Is that how you answer the high priest? I want to know why the father didn't come down at that moment and slap that man in his face and say, is that how you talk to the Son of God? Like a rag doll, handed over yet again. After the questioning by the high priest, Jesus is given to the Roman authorities. It is Pilate's turn to question him. Somewhat surprisingly, Pilate, the Roman prefect or governor, actually comes back to the Jewish leaders and questions them. He doesn't want anything to do with Jesus' death, explaining that if they want to kill him, it's going to be up to them. But with their violent ways, 
knowing the evil tools of how the world can work. They respond in turn to Pilate by threatening him, that if you release this man, you're no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. They are using every avenue they have to kill Jesus. There is no limit to the violence that they are willing to commit to get what they want. Even if their religion tells them that they are not permitted to put anyone to death, they are still determined to have Jesus die and willing to use others to do their dirty work, as if the guilt would not be on them. But still, Pilate wants nothing to do with killing Jesus. He tells them, Take him yourself and crucify him. I find no case against him. He even tries to offer Jesus an escape, but the people are so hell-bent on violence towards Jesus that they instead want a well-known criminal released. Pilate can hardly stand it. But seeing their hatred and wanting nothing to do with it, he washes his hands of the situation. If Jesus is to die, his blood will be upon them. We learn that this is exactly what they want. Violence. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they dressed him in a purple robe to mock and torment him. They kept coming up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And striking him on the face. They mocked him, shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! How did God not come down to smite them at this point? Where is the God of the Old Testament that used to lead them into battle? Why isn't God returning violence for violence yet? What is God waiting for? Reluctantly, Pilate too hands over this weak man, this rag doll, now to the ultimate violence of the executioners. They nail him to the cross with evil cheers of joy. They even decide that a normal crucifixion isn't going to be violent enough. So they also nail his feet. Something they only did when they really wanted to take pleasure in the violence. When they really wanted the pain and suffering to last as long as it could. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus... They took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic, one of Jesus' prized possessions, and they cast lots for it in front of the dying man and in front of his mother and friends. Why won't God come down yet? Why won't God stop them from doing this to God's beloved son? Has the God of the Old Testament become too old and weak? How is this happening? The Father does not come to stop it. Jesus dies on that cross. But they are not done with the violence against him yet. Even to his lifeless body, they pierce a spear into his side just to make sure that he really is out of their way. Why didn't God stop it? That must have been the question that the disciples and Jesus' mother were asking as they looked up and saw Jesus at the hands of such violence. That's what we want too. For God to stop this madness of killing and suffering and sin and violence. So why doesn't God stop it? We live in a world of sin and suffering and pain and violence happens. At least until Jesus came. Jesus shows us a new way to deal with violence. 
instead of returning blow for blow, instead of pulling a sword against those who hold a sword to us, we learn that we are to return our sword to our sheath. And this is hard to swallow until we realize what Jesus actually did on that cross. It was not God's weakness that we saw on the cross of Jesus Christ. We did not witness God not coming to save God's only Son, but instead, instead we saw the greatest strength that anybody has ever seen. We witnessed Jesus absorbing the pain and suffering and sin and death and violence. He took it. He kept his mouth shut and did what nobody else could do because all other people are too weak to do it. He took it all for us. He absorbed all that violence that they gave him. But even more, he absorbed all of the effects of even the forces of sin and death. Jesus absorbed. He took from us our penalty of sin on that cross. He absorbed the words of violence of the people screaming, crucify him. He painfully soaked in all of that pain, suffering and sin and death and violence so that we don't have to. Sure, it might have looked like weakness to some, but to us it was the greatest act of strength that any person has ever accomplished. It would have been easy for the Father to just come down and smite all those who hated the Son of God. But God wasn't doing the easy thing with Jesus. God was doing the hardest thing. God was taking all of those things that harm us, all of those things that we deserve for our sinfulness, and God was pulling them out of this world through the cross. God absorbed the violence. God refused to play by the rules of war that we set up. Today on Good Friday, we can't help but painfully witness the violence that happens to Jesus. And it hurts so bad. Some say that God uses violence to destroy the powers of sin and death. That violence was necessary for Jesus to do what he did on the cross. Without the violence, there wouldn't have even been a cross to begin with. And thus, there would be no salvation without it. Some say that violence is a necessity in this world even for God to do what God does. But what we see here is absolutely no violence from Jesus, no violence from God. But instead, what we are privileged to see here is Jesus refusing to respond with violence, to the violence that others offered him. Could God just come down and throw lightning bolts at those crucifying Jesus? Yes, absolutely. But no matter how much our violent minds want to see violence for violence, God just won't do it. God's ways are greater than our ways. On the cross, we see a God who is willing to absorb the violence for us. All of that violence that Jesus is receiving, all of it is completely undeserved. Instead of returning violence for violence, we have a God who takes the suffering and pain away for us, who stops the vicious cycle begun with Cain and Abel. On the cross, we see Jesus dying in our places, suffering the pain that we deserve for our violence and trespasses towards each other. On the cross, we see Jesus Christ paying for all of those sins of all those that God created. Even all those who sat there all day, mocking him to his face and screaming, crucify him, crucify him. Sadly, I know that if it were me on that cross, 
that I would have given in and come down to smite them all when I saw my mother crying there at the base of the cross. Thank God that Jesus didn't break, but instead took it all in and absorbed the pain and suffering for us because nobody else could have done it other than the Son of God. Nobody. Amen.